Yeah, Jeff had earlier had uh, exhausted our supply of Greek symbols, so I don't have any of my presentation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like I said, my name is Bruce Marshall. Um, I've been interested in passive research for a while, and I've looked at challenge questions, three questions uh, around 2007 and kind of put it in the back burner. But I had an opportunity, opportunity fell in my lap uh, earlier this year when several password dumps that I was analyzing also happened to have challenge questions, security questions in them. And so I want to give you some analysis. I had a chance to actually look, look at the information, break it down, like uh, like you said, try to give you some real world feedback on how people are actually using these. My understanding, my my knowledge, there's been a lot of studies, been some academic papers surveying people on what they would use for security questions and surveying them on what their answers would be and surveying them on some of those those uh, practices, but not so much, here's what people are actually doing in, in the wild. So I think most of us probably know what security questions are, but just as a very slight intro, essentially it's a question that you either generate as a user or the site asks you that is then answered during the registration process. So what is your pet's name? You know, what are your mother's name? A lot of the classic questions that we see. Those are typically used for a couple different reasons, either as backup authentication, which is what happens if a person forgets their password. So now, what are we going to do? Well, most sites don't want to put a lot of money into customer service or answering emails or trying to help people through that process. So they create a self-service system, which may often involve typing the answer to your security question. And we'll either give you your password, reset your password, or email you a link that you can use that is reset your password. It all kind of differs on how they do that. Secondary authentication kind of came about, became more popular back, especially in the United States, with financial institutions with the FFIC guidance on authentication for online banking, where they said single factor passwords no longer acceptable. Now we're going to expect you to have multi-factor. Well, they kind of caved in and said multi-factor is now two things you know as opposed to one thing, as opposed to how to have biometrics or tokens or something like that. They are designed, uh, security questions are designed, knowing that there's going to be a trade-off between the security that's offered to the uniqueness or the lack of predictability and how easy they are to remember. Because you have to recognize that these are created or, or often used if they're used for backup authentication for people who didn't do a good job of remembering their passwords. So you don't want to give them like a backup password. You want to give them something that they're more likely to use, hopefully better, and that's the personal information. So then you'll hear security questions called, like I like to call them challenge questions, but I like that term a little bit better. Security questions, secret questions. Secret questions aren't necessarily secret information. Uh, some of you may have seen this, this Twitter feed from, from Robert earlier this month, but this is just personal information which may or may not be something that you share with other people. You don't always have a good feel for what's, who's that's been disclosed to, who may know it, who else that person has shared it with. Um, and sure enough, some of the research that has been done in some academic papers has shown that if you ask like a spouse or you ask a brother or sister or other close family member that they have a great chance of guessing some of your personal information um, being able to answer those same questions. Whether that's, a, whether that's a risk or not depends kind of on what you're protecting and what you're worried about. Um, this notation down here, this little number thing, just points back to the references. I've got a references slide of what papers some of this data, some of the comparative data uh, being pulled from. So there was three environments. I, I initially came upon these uh, back in December and January. I was doing some analysis of the password dump. I was trying to look at all the public password dumps that were new that month, both in, in December and January, what types of information they had and what was being disclosed. I have it on, I think one of these at first, I don't know if it was Sierra or Alpha, these are code names I've given to them, but that had said security questions, along with the password and, and user information, had security questions, security answers. Um, I was actually able to find two more other cases, both back in December as well. Now, when these actually took place, when these were pulled by the hacker, how close they were, I know that in, in the Echoes case especially, they, uh, there was some discussion because someone else was trying to claim credit for it and then Anonymous the said, no, you're not the one to disclose this. Uh, whether that was actually been pulled earlier in 2012 than in the October's uh, December timeframe. But these were all obviously a little bit different situation. Different, different sites had different types of user bases. I would say they are all lower security. These aren't your banks. Um, if, if someone had to create a second account, 
it wasn't going to be the end of the world if they couldn't remove their password. In fact, in, in Sierra, which I would rank probably the most professional level of, of user base, they still have people that are going there to create two or three different accounts for themselves because apparently they forgot their password and either didn't know how to use their security question to reset their account or just didn't work out so they couldn't remember what their answer was. Uh, these were all PHP sites. SQL injection was responsible for at least Sierra and Alpha, Echo. There wasn't any information on whether that was the case or not. Oh, the information stored. So what was what was in these databases that were dumped? Uh, and Alpha and Echo's case was pretty much just name, username, email address, password, security question, security answer. In Sierra's case, they actually had a lot more information. They had uh, greetings or um, I'm thinking title, but it's basically Mr. or Mrs. Ms. So you knew whether it was a man or a woman. Although I did see one man named Lorraine, so I'm not quite sure how accurate that was. But anyway, based on what the user typed in. Also had their education level, so their degree, and then had their birthday. So those were all some other things that I looked at to see whether some, some of them seemed to be interesting tidbits about them, but there weren't. So these are the registration pages. Um, you know, I kind of just pulled out the, the relevant parts when the user was creating their account. Again, this was after the, after these dumps had happened. This was back in the December, January timeframe where I actually said, okay, well, let's go out and look at these sites, see what's on the registration page. So I don't know if this was the same six months before that or a year before, whatever these people were signing up for their accounts, there could have been changes. But this is what I found. This is the closest I can give you as to what people were being told or asked for during the registration process. So besides Echo kind of gets into a little bit, what are we, what's the obvious thing that we're, we're seeing no, no real instruction to the user on? What question? Like what, what is the purpose of the secret question? What is, you know, why do I use this? At least in Echo's case, they do say, just this question and answer used to recover your account if you forget your password. But it doesn't get into what makes a good question, what types of information should you have in here, what are the concerns about security questions, you can also see, uh, I don't really show the details on Sierra, but we'll get into that in a minute. Sierra had pre-selected questions. They had five, selections, five questions that a user could select one of and then answer. But both Alpha and Echo had completely free-form question and answer. You can come up with your own question and decide how to answer that. Now, who here is a little concerned about that? <laughs> Knowing what we know about users, uh, do we really want to let them have their own free-form uh, question and answer. I was kind of the same way. Uh, I was a little surprised to find that they're not, you know, these 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 are cheapo, you know, PHP, probably not a lot of time and money put into. But there's other sites out there, and Google used to be the same way. Uh, this is Cisco's registered email <coughs> service, which is their extranet cloud secure email service that they offer as a, as a product to clients. And this, you can either choose one of the pre-selected questions or you can type in your own question and answer. It's, it's an option you have as a user when you when you roll for it. So it's not completely off the wall to think about this. In fact, a couple of papers, uh, previous papers on security questions had actually recommended or seen it as a negative if you didn't allow users to set their own questions because they saw that as a way of giving power back to the users for their own security decisions, which again, I don't think is a good thing. Um, one of the papers, uh, access control, the number two there, access control, for shared knowledge, looked at similar situations where if a user was going to write a question that should be answered to authenticate to pictures, how long did they think that they took to write that question? And the average was about 15 seconds that they were, 15 seconds worth of time that they were using to say, okay, what's a good question for me to use to secure this information? Not much time. Um, in a similar paper, they also asked for what users rated as most important. And memorability, was rated about 70% for how important it was, as very important for writing security questions while uh, security was only about 44%. So people aren't always going to make, the, they're, they're concerned at this point, they understand what the security question is going to be used for, they know, hey, this is going to bail me out if I forget my password, let's make it something fairly easy for me to guess. 
All right, so these are the five questions that the Sierra case offered. Um, they, you know, you, like I said, you selected one question and you had to write, write in your answer for that. One of the things that some earlier research has kind of tried to break down as far as the types of security questions and some of the pros and cons of them was the concept of separating factual questions from opinions or preferences types of questions. So what appear of these questions would you say, in factual essentially is information that these should be the same for everyone. So what is, what is the current president's name? Or what is the, you know, what was, what's the home you know, football team of Las Vegas? Opinions are information that could be different for a user. What's your favorite? If you hear the word favorite, and it typically gives me an opinion. So in this case, the facts were what's your pet's name? What's your oldest cousin's first and last name? And of course, the opinions then were, yeah, there's the favorites. What would you like to do? Um, preferences were seen as being something that wouldn't potentially change as much. So if you say, my favorite book is X, uh, that that's going to be your favorite book forever. But unfortunately, that's just that's not really the case. Facts tend to be more static. Um, in some cases, the answer will change. So if you say, how old is your oldest child? Well, this year it's going to be seven, next year it's going to be eight, and so on. So that can change, uh, but otherwise they tend to be more static. Um, I think my reference here to the paper is facts were about 10% more likely, according to the study that I'm, I'm referencing here, to be guessed by a trusted acquaintance than a, an opinion-based question. So people are more likely to know facts about you, who your kids are, what your pet names are, as opposed to what are your favorites of certain things. So kind of keep in mind, I'm going to reference back to these question numbers. So pet, last name of your teacher, title of your favorite book, oldest cousin's first and last name, and then the name of the country of your famous vacation. So one thing I was able to look at was how do people choose which questions they want to go to? Well, in Sierra, they only have five options. But you can see in the green line here, which is the total number of 1,036 users, what their preferences were for certain questions. Because when you're creating a library of questions, if you're offering them questions that they don't select or that aren't applicable to certain users or that aren't interesting that they don't want to answer, you may certainly have people focusing on some questions more than others. In this case, uh, the ratio of men and women in the study was about uh, one to five, so, or, or men were one-fifth of the 1,036, women were the other four-fifths, so there were a lot more women. You can kind of see from a statistical significant standpoint, it's hard to say whether this, whether certain questions like pet name, the first question, more men chose pet names, does that mean men were likely to associate with that type of question? And it looks like there's a good chance of that. Um, likewise, with vacations for vacation countries for question five, um, women were a little bit ahead of that. So I thought that was interesting as far as the distribution of how that can make a difference just based on gender or based on what questions people are going with, but it also certainly makes it easier as an attacker to target what questions you should be trying to compile information about if you know that, hey, it's not very likely I'm going to come up with a list of first names and last names of cousins is question four. Um, so I'll focus on compiling information for the others. So answer relevance. And relevance is, is a little bit subjective. This is where I looked at, does the answer that the user provided answer the question that was asked? And I gave this one of three ratings. Either yes, it did, so they provided their pet's name, they provided the country of their dream vacation. Uh, partially, which meant the, they answered with the intent of the question, but it may not have been quite what the question was asking. So if the question was asking for the country of their dream vacation, they put in California, or they put in New York City. They put in something which makes sense in the context relative to the context of the, of, of the answer of the question, but it's not exactly what we're looking for. And then no's were questions, answers where they, they really didn't have any bearing on, on what was being asked. So they maybe they put in some completely else, either random information or something else that didn't seem to make sense. From my perspective, it didn't seem to make sense. So does this matter from a security standpoint? Do we care? I mean, are we, does it matter to us? We write the questions, or if, if we do write the questions, does it matter if they give us the information we're looking for? Well, in some cases, it certainly can. If you're relying on the answer to their questions to be 
Um, you say, I'm asking for a country because we know there's X number of countries. Maybe if they're answering with a continent instead, suddenly now we have a lot less answers that you're trying to then just have to, have to guess. And so that's not what you're looking for. And other times I can actually add security, depending on what types of answers they ask. You know, if you do if you don't answer a logical, provide a logical answer to the question, that can make an attacker's job more difficult. If they're trying to guess countries and you put in a state or you put in a city, they have to know to expand their guessing pool to those other options as opposed to just guessing what the question is specifically asking for. So answer popularity. And this is something that has been looked at before in studies um, as far as, obviously, and a lot of us intuitively know, if you ask them what their name is, there's going to be distributions of names that are much more popular than other names. Pets, states, you know, locations, vacations, book titles, things like that. So this is kind of a look at as far as the uniqueness of the answers. And I, the way I matched this was it had to be, it didn't have to be case sensitive. So, you know, whether the uh, United States was capitalized or lowercase didn't matter, but the spacing had to be the same, the spelling had to be the same. There were people that put in United State with no S on the end. Those were not counted as duplicates of the United States. They were only counted against other United State entries. So this again is, is kind of interesting. You can kind of see question four, which was what was your cousin's, your oldest cousin's first and last name? Um, there were a lot less answers in there if you remember back to how many people selected that question, but there weren't any duplicates because it's asking for two pieces of information which have a lot more probabilities in them than um, what your ideal vacation number five would be. So I found that that, that found to be very, very interesting in, in telling about how some questions are certainly stronger, at least in this case, stronger than others when it comes to the types of answers you'd expect. So ideally, if you're making those questions, you want to try to stay away from the ones which have the easier and more predictable answers. You know, what, what's your favorite color? What color you're using? What, uh, how many kids do you have? Something like that. Um, the It's No Secret paper that I reference here, they found that about 13% of the questions that they interviewed people on had duplicates. O overall, the 100 and some questions that they looked at, about 13% had duplicates among the users. And that was only looking at the top five popular guesses. So security answer links, um, and kind of looking back at, you know, if we, when we analyze passwords, I took a lot of the password analysis models and kind of tried to apply them to security answers. In some cases that makes sense, in other cases it doesn't. Um, but in these three environments, looking at what people were able to add, answer with, you can see that in Alpha and Echo, one character answers were fine, which as you can probably guess, if you're guessing numbers, or if you're guessing single letters, or if you're guessing symbols, it's pretty easy to go through that pool, even if you know nothing about the user, and, and exhaust those possibilities. Um, certainly, even if you're trying logical answers, it makes sense to try to start with shorter answers um, in some of these cases. Now, in Sierra's case, they enforced a minimum. There were two exceptions for some reason, but a minimum of six characters for the answers, uh, which is both good and bad. It's good in the sense that now we know that people have to at least guess six character answers if an attacker is trying to get into the system, but it's bad in the sense that users weren't able to use some of the answers that were logical, relevant answers to their questions. So if your dog's name is Max, you can't answer it in the context of that question because the system is preventing you from putting that answer in. So you had to modify it some way. Max dog, or my pet is Max, or you had to put in some other adaptation, which may have hurt how easy, it was, how easy it is for you then to remember that as a user um, going forward. So it's also interesting to see, kind of from a, from, and it's probably not that surprising, from a word standpoint, um, we're still looking at around that six to eight character transitions where the bulk of these answers are coming in. And especially in Alpha and Echo, there were a lot of like high as the question and high as the answer, or other short phrases, you know, uh, were, would be fairly simple for someone to look at it. So within 10 questions, um, about 90% of, within just 10 characters, we represent about 90% of the answers within Alpha and Echo. Sierra was only about 60, 68%. They had a little bit longer, and whether that's because of the book titles or, or, or uh, countries or other things like that, why those happen to be a little bit longer on the long side, I'm not exactly sure. Uh, the maximums we saw, the maximums output was about 75 characters, Echo was 95, and Sierra was 50. Those, there weren't very many, like I said, uh, 
even close to that neighborhood as far as the, the answer things. So character composition, we kind of talked about that earlier, the, the character makeup. Uh, and this is a little bit, I will say, I will say it's skewed, although I, it's, it's accurate. The symbols on here include the space character, which as you would guess in a lot of answers that are words or sentences are going to have a lot more spaces. So if I took space out of the symbol category, you'd probably see all these, these symbol occurrences fall off the top five and be replaced with something else. Um, spaces were, are definitely the most popular symbol. In most cases, you can see that they're just using lowercase. Um, in cases, there's multiple, like I said, lowercase plus the space character is probably the most likely lowercase plus symbol uh, combination that we have here. So again, from an attacker standpoint, that can help them customize their word list. But as some of you probably know, there's systems out there which don't really care about case. When you're typing in your security answer, they'll accept upper case or lowercase. They may accept character transpositions. They may accept other variations of uh, the security answer that aren't exact matches and still say that that's, that's fine from their perspective. So here's one that I thought was, I guess, the most damning or the most interesting depending on your perspective, <laughs> was looking at other user information and saying, does that help me answer, provide the answer that's going to let me into this account? So the answer matches the password. Well, that's not really helpful from an attacker standpoint because we don't know what their if we're trying to get in this way, we really don't know what their password is. But from a user recovery, password recovery standpoint, it's also not helpful. These people either misjudged what they thought this answer was, this question was supposed to be asking, or they just essentially if they forget their password, they're also going to forget their security answer, so it won't matter, they can't get into the, they can't get into it anyway. Um, answer matches the email name, that's just the Prefix before the at sign, so you know BK Marshall. Uh, answer matches the actual username in the system. Answer matches the question, which, as you can imagine, is very bad. Uh, especially in, in, in Echo's case, there was a large number of users that were just putting the string in, in two times, which provides no security at all. But probably worst of all was the people who actually put in the question. That field was was displayed only if they type in their email address or their username, whichever that particular system prompted them for, uh, they actually put their password in that. So that sticky note that used to be on the side of the monitor where they wrote their password reminders, now is on your website out there for anyone that happens to get into their username or you know, guess, guess it, the right username or the right email address. So those are, are pretty, pretty terrible situations to have to deal with. Now you say, well, we can put in some, some expression checking. We can try to say, uh, certainly you can give users advice, feedback on to do this. But you can also give them some, some system-enforced guidelines and say, hey, you can't have your password as your question or your answer, all right? What if they put in a variation of that, a variation of the password? Or they split their password into two words? Or they, you know, there's all sorts of scenarios which are hard to compensate for, um, especially if you've encrypted the password and you're going to have to keep that in memory during the restoration process. There's just a lot more hassles to try to compare those two. Um, if you're going to try to prevent them putting that in the actual question to begin with. So my suggestions. I say, you know, forget the user, let's not let them define their own questions. There's, there's, you can do it, but it's, it's going to be very fraught with challenges. Um, the combinations of better questions, and that's been recommended for several years. We've got about two, two and a half decades of research on challenge questions in, in academia as well as practical out here in the real world of saying, hey, we really should be using combinations because the more combinations you have, even if one question is somewhat weak or weaker, you've got another question that they also have to get correct in order to get into the account. I certainly suggest mixing it with other security controls, and some systems have that in place now. Like, to Cisco's credit, if I answer my, my security questions correct, all they do is they email me a password reset link. So someone still has to get an email. They're not giving direct access directly to my account. But whether that's implemented in whatever particular system, your bank, um, you know, some other financial firm, an online store, that's going to differ from site to site. That's certainly something that, that reduces the risk of you it. Um, if you're prompting for other account information, sometimes people ask for social security numbers, bank account numbers, you know, whatever. What was your last purchase? Something like that to verify along with those controls. But at some point, it kind of becomes a question of, was it worth it to have the security question if we have to back it up with all this other stuff? Is there just is it okay just to use this other stuff, or is the security question acting as some 
beneficial role in this process. Uh, alternatives. I don't really you know, get excited about seeing security questions if that's my, my only, especially if you don't know when you're signing up for the site. Like I said, when you look at those registration screens, I don't have any idea what else is going to take place during that password reset process. Do I need to be concerned about this or don't I? Um, I like the alternative of saying, you know, don't you know, give me this option here. Uh, Microsoft did some research on that where they said that you know, people could choose several different variations of authenticating themselves, like an email address or a text to their phone or whatever, and as long as those added up to a, the right score, those would be an accepted option. Um, obviously, from a user standpoint, there's, there's two ways we can go about this. I can say, well, let's tell users how to avoid getting themselves in these situations, which is okay. Um, I'd rather encourage users to use password managers so they don't end up in the situation in the first place. So they don't have to go, that doesn't eliminate the, these backup uh, password recovery systems, but it certainly does reduce the chance the need for organizations to rely so heavily on them. Um, one criticism I have, and, it's, and I have mixed feelings about this, is where we tell users to put random information there, which I, I think from a security standpoint is good, but it conflicts often with the advice on websites like this one where it says, hey, don't make up a fake answer. You know, don't, don't give us some random piece of information we're gonna need to be, so we're, we're kind of putting the users in a position trying to decide what advice should I follow when it comes to security. You really should be saying, if these aren't secure, if, if security questions don't provide good security, then let's stop using them, or let's find an alternative. There's other alternatives out there, some of which can also use knowledge-based authentication. So obviously this is kind of a teaser. Um, I didn't really get into what Alpha and Echo looked like as far as their challenge because they have uh, the custom users. So there's you know, dozens of variations of what is my pet's name. And in the case, actually in Echo's case especially, they had a very heavily uh, Portuguese, Spanish, and other languages in there that I had started to parse using translation software and decided you know, this is very good. This is much more than I had signed up for. Um, so I'm going to focus on looking at the English variations. I'm going to look at produce some more information, uh, put out some more data on these results. I like, just couldn't get it all done before this talk. Um, and we kind of talked about you know strength of security answers and strength of passwords being a subjective term. But I am interested in seeing you know if someone knows to choose a good password, do they also know to choose a good security answer? You know, do they have they don't have so much control about that? But um, I think that's interesting to look into. Obviously. We know that in the past, word lists worked pretty well for you know, top five cities, top five sports teams, as far as guessing answers, but I want to run the actual data through those and find out. And then are there predictable, are there other predictable trends? If, if I ask, what is your favorite um, romantic movie, are guys less likely to answer that than women? Are you know, women more likely, less likely to answer what's your favorite sports team questions than men? And how does that figure into the security equation? Here's the references, I mean, you can, these slides will be available, so it's you don't have to write down. But um, the paper's not up there yet, but this this could be a placeholder for you if you want to come back and get a copy of these slides and get access. Because I think some of these slides have percentages in the graphs and things as far as the individual percentages. So I know that some of you are probably interested in that. Um, if you want to let me know what other things you'd be interested in seeing, hey, what is X Y Z? How that work out in these cases? Certainly, let me know on Twitter email. Or uh, you can leave a comment on the wall. So, any questions? Yep. Hey, have you done any research into uh, the use of what the questions are things that can be easily researched on social media? Uh, like, mother's maiden name is something that you can typically get from a genealogy site and so forth. And then, second comment is I don't, you know, your, one of your points there was that the, uh, the, the rely relying less on security questions would be beneficial, I don't think that has any effect at all because just the existence of the security questions and the fact that they're mandatory in so many cases, basically it's a vulnerability sitting out there anyway. Right, and I agree with your, your, your the question was, first of all, has there been research done on acquiring information? So uh, mother's maiden names, for your example. And there have been several papers actually written in the past um, and I think maybe some of these, I don't remember the ones I referenced, but they're on my website. Pretty much I've, I've got a large index of papers. Um, they've looked at getting all the usernames from Facebook and comparing those to names. They've looked at pulling records from DMVs or 
you know, the United States Census publishes information on popular first names, last names. Um, so a lot of those studies have been done. I haven't run them against this, my particular data set here. Um, the second question, you have a very valid point about even if users don't forget their password, that that mechanism is still out there, aren't they still insecure? And the question, and the answer to that is yes. My hope is with less people forgetting their passwords, there's less need to automate those types of password reset systems. Now, whether that has an impact or not, you know, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But ideally, again, that's, it's a good practice to recommend anyway. Yep. Real quick, probably out of time. Uh, something that would be interesting is how many sites encrypt the question and answer in the same way that the password hashes, whether it's zero percent or whatever. The other thing you look into is what the credit unions do because they have a play on this, which is really interesting, in that they ask you trick questions about your credit profile that only you would know and only you would be able to figure out whether that was a trick question or a real question. Right. It's sort of interesting in how how uh, how useful and how how often that fails or succeeds. Yeah. Yeah, and to your, your question there, do do sites encrypt or or hash the, the answers? I think in most cases the answer is, is no, because they're having encryption is, is is possible, but I think in most cases they're not encrypting because they're gonna do that comparison where they can't they're not trying to do an exact match. Um, so that presents its own problems. Obviously in this case they were all in plain text, so but I don't know any surveys out there of how that's handled. Yeah, that's uh, that's the time we've got. So thank you, Bruce.